Hey everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics. In this questions answered video, uh, the question is, what's some advice on what to do after a lethal force encounter? This is one of those topics that's very, very circular. It's never ending. It's something that we're constantly gonna discuss in the, uh, the self-defense community. Uh, reason being is that there, there just aren't a lot of people out there who can give firsthand experience of this is what I did, this is what worked, because every situation is gonna be unique in a lot of ways, which we're gonna get into. Uh, of course, I'm not a lawyer, uh, so I'm not going to be giving legal advice, but I am going to be giving common sense advice based on my personal experience, my professional experience, and collective knowledge of those I've worked with, their experience as well. Um, so again, not going to be legal advice. Obviously, you should talk to a lawyer for that. They're the only ones that can give you legal advice. They're the only ones that you should actually take legal advice from. Uh, but this is a very important topic because <clears throat> sometimes when we think about it, we think of uh, just the end game, so to speak, as in I use my firearm inside the home or outside the home or in the vehicle or, or wherever the situation is, I use it in self-defense and I incapac incapacitate my threat. But there's, there's other possibilities that we have to be aware of and the ways that we practice and the ways that we train and our mindset can go a long ways towards making sure we're in the most beneficial position in the unlikely but possible event that we have to use lethal force. Now before I get started, before I, I kind of go through what I want to talk about, I, I want to kind of lay a foundation. Uh, the reason I want to do this is because it sets the tone for what we're actually discussing. When we think about the use of lethal force, how many people do you know who actually have experience in the lethal use of, use of lethal force? The number is probably pretty small. Uh, even in my line of work and in, in, in my, my past, you know, full-time law enforcement military contractor, the number was still contained within that one little environment of people I knew and not everybody I worked with had used lethal force. Uh, there was a much larger number of people who had threatened to use lethal force in certain situations. So when you think about how many people you know, the number is probably going to be pretty small or it's small compared to the much larger number of the actual population of even your town, your county, your city, your state, so on and so forth. So. Uh, and I've, I've used these numbers before, but they're still current um, as in uh, the data that's been collected. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of go through them again just so we can lay that foundation. 7.3% uh, of living Americans have served in the military. Uh, you've got 0.4% who are serving currently. Um, of that total number, 5.5 million served in a peacetime military where there was no uh, actual conflict. Now, during the height of the Afghanistan and the Iraq war, our most recent major high-scale conflicts, 40% of deployed forces saw combat. Now, the reason I put that combat in quotation marks is because there's no accurate way to know specifically how many of that 40% actually pulled triggers on bad guys or threatened to pull triggers on bad guys. So the number's kind of washing. And again, since we're talking about domestic self-defense, their experience in a use of force is gonna have completely different, uh, well, it's going to be a completely different procedure, uh, combat versus you know stateside self-defense. So, just laying that groundwork, those you know in the military who may have been in combat, their first-hand experience for what to do after a lethal force encounter may not be germane to your 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 daily life. So then let's look at another group, law enforcement. Uh, 1.3 million active duty law enforcement. Now that number is accounting for uh, reserves, so it's a little higher because we've got federal law enforcement and we've got state local law enforcement. Uh, there's no reliable number for retired officers, so I can't include them in there. Unfortunately, statistics being what they are, they're often incomplete. So looking at that total number, the 1.3 million active duty law enforcement currently serving, um, out of the 40 million Americans that reported contact with law enforcement in 2008, 1.4% had force used against them. Under, underscoring this, uh, these are self-reporting numbers, so if a law enforcement agency doesn't report the numbers and the citizen doesn't report the numbers to one of the very, very few categories of, of uh, uh, NGOs and, and government agencies and themselves that collect this data, uh, that number may be higher. Um, it's obviously not going to be lower because it's self-reporting data. So 1.4% had force used against them. Now, how many law enforcement uses of lethal force do we have as an average? I don't like averaging because then we get into these numbers that just get parroted and parroted and parroted and parroted. So if you, if you have a number like, oh, 32,000 gun deaths a year in the US, 
it, if you think about that critically, that can't possibly be the truth because there's not exactly 32,000 people killed every year. That number came from one specific study and just keep getting handed off and handed off and handed off and handed off, even though the numbers fluctuate from year to year. Uh, so we'll look at 2012, the, the information that we have. 4,108 uses of lethal force by law enforcement. Uh, according to Census Bureau, the, the 2015 update, the uh, United States population is just 500,000 shy of 322 million. So let's just say 321 million for the sake of conversation. Out of 321 million Americans, we had 4,108 uses of force by law enforcement resulted that would be considered the use of lethal force. Those uses of lethal force may not have resulted in a fatality, uh, but it was, by definition, a use of lethal force. Again, those are reporting numbers, self-reporting numbers, so the number may actually be higher. Now, according to the Violence Policy Center, uh, same time period, we had 230 uses of lethal force by citizens. 230 uses of lethal force by citizens. So added that to the 4,000, our number is still statistically extremely, extremely low for those that have uh, first-hand knowledge of the use of lethal force. Now getting a little bit more into specifics, looking at violent crimes and property crimes. Um, according to the National Crime Victimization Survey, um, they sub and again, this is self-reporting data, uh, that this is a statistical data that's either, that's either collected in person or people self-report. So again, the numbers can be higher. Um, and of course, there's gonna be some margin of error in there, but there were just under 30 million violent crimes between 2007 and 2011 reported to them. Um, of that just under 30 million, um, you had 626,800 uses of force, threatened uses of force. So people defended themselves in some way. Uh, you look at property crimes, we had just under 85 million property crimes. Same reporting year, 2007 to 2011, and you had 141,200 uses of force to defend against that particular situation. Um, now think back to the number of lethal uses of force by citizens which was, you know, 230. And again, that's from a slightly different agency. So again, there's, there can be some statistical error in there. But I think if, and, and I, I wanted to include this information just to kind of underscore the point, as I've already said, that the amount of people in this country who have firsthand experience or secondhand experience with the use, the physical use of lethal force is significantly lower than maybe some people believe. In a country of, you know, 321 million and change, um, it is a statistical anomaly to have someone actually use force against someone, lethal force against someone. The threat of the use of force is much more common, which I think goes along with common sense. So now we've got all the numbers and all the statistics and everything like that out of the way. So now we can get to what we're actually talking about, which is what should I do? The question was, what should I do? Um, what should be my first steps after the use of force? Um, we can kind of separate that uh, a little bit because we want to talk about what might be considered administrative and what needs to necessarily happen in the moment. Um, so if I use my firearm to defend myself, if I deliver lethal force, I shoot someone, if I have to shoot someone to protect myself or protect someone that I decided to protect, defense of a third party, defense of a family member, um, initially I need to reacquaint myself with my surroundings. That is going to be my first step after I'm sure my threat, at least, at least in that moment, is not an immediate threat no longer. So when you see people in classes or you see people on Instagram or you see people in videos where they're like, they pull their gun back in real quick and they start scanning around, that is designed to, that, that technique is taught, instructed to encourage people to reacquaint themselves with their surroundings. The artificiality from it comes in the fact that it's occurring in a training class this is where they're probably learning it from, and they're on a line with all these other shooters, and every single time they turn their head, they're not seeing anything new. They're not getting any new data. Uh, there are ways to get people to pay attention, like the instructors, you know, this has been done to me way in the past, where an instructor would stand behind me with like two fingers up, or three fingers up, or four fingers up, or whatever, and if I didn't see those fingers, I was admonished for not noticing a guy behind me with four fingers up. When I scan, I'm not looking for fingers. I'm looking for additional threats. I'm also identifying potential witnesses or potential accomplices. I'm reacquainting myself with my surroundings. If I walk into a situation, I have spatial awareness with what I've passed by. I have recent history with everything that's behind me. So lethal use of force, where's my wife? Where's my kids? There was a guy that was just standing here on his phone. Where did he go? Is everyone okay? 
That's the whole purpose of scanning. Um, it's not search and assess, it's not tactile derb, it's, it's not even range theatrics if it's taught correctly. But it's really just common sense. When I teach it, I tell people just to look around and reacquaint yourself with your surroundings, identify potential witnesses, identify likely exits if you need to flee the area. This is what we're doing. We're maintaining solid spatial awareness with the environment that we're in. So initially, after you make sure your threat is down, that should be the next step. You should become, reacquaint yourself with your surroundings, identify potential witnesses. Um, if you need to, start working, start, start, uh, start getting people to help. Uh, hey, can you call 911? Hey, can, can you render aid? The render aid thing, we all want to be super tough guys about things, but if, you, if your whole goal is to stop the threat, and I understand there's going to be an emotional situation, like this guy just tried to hurt me, which is why I use lethal force, but you've already incapacitated him. If he's still alive, he's still alive. Um, it is a very personal decision for you yourself to render aid, but you can ask someone else to render aid, or maybe uh, not interfere with anyone who attempts to render aid on his behalf. Uh, remember, we shoot to incapacitate. So it, as much as, and again, this would be probably a very hard decision for some people to make to, to render aid themselves, because there's gonna be that emotional uh, aspect there. There's no avoiding that, we're, we're humans. Um, that's why they say fired your gun in anger, because emotion is always going to be, to a certain degree, everything's gonna vary, part of this. My next step is going to be to contact 911. Now, what happens depends on how that's going to go. Remember when I said it's far more likely for you to threaten the use of lethal force than it is for you to use it. And then we have to talk about categories of crimes. But first, let's talk about what actually happened. If I am threatened, regardless of the circumstance, and I draw my firearm, that may end it. If a guy's, you know, the cliche, give me your wallet, car keys, whatever, property crime, um, you feel threatened enough that, that you produce your firearm to protect yourself and then that, that ends it. Because sometimes just the, the physical act of drawing and pointing the gun, if you have time to issue verbal commands, for instance, may literally, that, that's it, it stops. You don't actually have to use force at that point. Your threat of force was enough to stop the situation, which is ideal. Uh, we can't depend on it, we don't want to count on it, but we should accept it for what it is if it happens. If that occurs, 911 calls still need to take place. The situation isn't going to be as egregious uh, because obviously there was no discharge of a firearm and there was no potential loss of life. There definitely wasn't any, any, any actual incapacitation. Unless it was a psychological incapacitation, the guy just completely lost his shit and fell apart. That's cool too. So the 911 call is going to be a little bit different. If you use lethal force, if you actually discharge your weapon and you strike your threat, that also is going to factor into how things go. So when we talk about contacting 911, the great thing about 911 is the dispatchers do this for a living. They receive 911 calls, and it's a gambit of different calls, um, from the benign uh, to the ridiculous, like someone called 911 because their uh, Pizza Hut was out of wings, um, to the, the absolute frantic where a woman is calling from the closet of her home because someone's in her house. Um, dispatchers are literally trained to deal with this kind of thing so we have to allow them to follow their script because the call determines um, how the order of things works so if i call number one chances are the very first thing the dispatcher is going to ask me is where is my emergency not what but where in the event that a disconnect occurs they want to gather as specific detail as possible. They can't. GPS locators and call tracing and everything like that, they're going to have a rough idea of where you are, especially you know, from cell phone landline, um, at least to an address. But they might, you might be able to give them specifics, like, you know, I'm calling from the, I'm calling from the back hallway of, you know, the whatever 13 movie theater, or I'm calling from the side parking lot of the gas station that I'm at, or, or what have you. Very specific information answer their questions instead of trying to feed them information because trying to override them may may upset the natural order of things another thing to consider and i've brought this up in videos in the past they're going to start law enforcement response as soon as they have a rough inkling of what's going on it's going to be law fire or fire law uh, emts law enforcement law enforcement emts the order is going to be based on what's occurring because emts aren't going to roll to a hot scene so they want to know is the scene safe for them to for them to come Information that has to go to the dispatchers is a, a really rough, solid, factual outline of what happened. Um, anything beyond that is getting into the uh, getting into the territory of legal counsel. So, if 
you drew your firearm and you discharged it and you wounded that person, that threat, you put him down, he's incapacitated. Whatever his final actual incapacitation is, whether it's he's actually no longer with us or he's, he has surrendered. Because to me, incapacitation means surrender or unconsciousness. To me, there is no third option. Um, that information needs to be relayed. Uh, I was attacked. I used my firearm in self-defense. Give them your description. Anytime a dispatcher uses the word victim, that's you. That's not the guy you shot, or the or whatever the situation is. You are the victim in the call. You are the victim calling 911. Um, giving that information, you need a solid description of you, solid description of what you're wearing, um, and a solid description of your location, where you're going to be, your immediate surroundings. Uh, I'm wearing jeans and a blue shirt. I'll be standing underneath the streetlight next to my white car, or or I'll be at the front door, or very, very specific information. So as they vector law enforcement to your location, those officers are gonna get that information as close to real time as possible, so we, we avoid any possible circumstantial situations where law enforcement mistakes you for the threat. The next step is, once you're reasonably sure the, safe is, the scene is safe and secure, you need to uh, take the gun out of your hands. A lot of different advice on this. My personal, my personal advice to you is holster it. Uh, just, just holster. Just go with it. Um, the law enforcement responding, of course, they have, there's going to be various levels of training, but they've dealt with firearms before. The more you make them at ease, the smoother the situation is going to go. Law enforcement response, uh, based on how the information is given to them from dispatch, may vary. You may get a full code three gun, strong rifles out, screaming, get on the ground, get on the ground, get on the ground, or you literally may just have raw, officers roll up code two, get out of their cars, be like, okay, what happened? Um, there is no way to predict exactly how the officers are going to respond because I don't know the officers. And that's one of the most frustrating parts about this is I know how it should go. That's not how it's always going to go. So law enforcement is on scene. Listen and obey to the word every single command they give you to prevent any possible mistake of fact. If they yell, get your hands in the air, put your hands as high as humanly possible in the air. If they tell you to reach back and pull your shirt up and rotate so they can see your waistband, that's fine. If you want to tell them you have a firearm, do it in a way that it doesn't appear to be threatening information. Like, my firearm is in my holster on my right hip, not I have a gun. That might not go well. Uh, and again, uh, most officers would be like, okay, that's probably the wrong way to say that, and nothing would happen but we need to remove the possibility of any mistakes, any negligence, any accidents. Um, so my firearm is. Uh, if they ask you where the gun is, tell them where it is. If they tell you to remove it, follow their instructions to the teeth. If they tell you to grab it with your thumb and index finger by the slide and you pull it out and you set it gently on the ground with the barrel pointing away from them and away from you. Do exactly that. If they tell you to drop it, drop it. If they tell you to throw it in the grass, throw it in the grass. If they tell you to kick it under a car, kick it under a car. Do not assume that the officer knows who you are. What I mean by that is, law enforcement supporting veteran, most patriotic guy ever, uh, you know, guys that piss red, white, and blue. Cops don't know that, nor do they care in that instance. So do not assume that your character as a person is going to be somehow picked up by that officer. He's going, he may treat you in a way that makes you feel like a criminal, like he's treating you unfairly. Your feelings may be hurt, nothing else will be. Obey the commands. I know it's unfortunate, and I wish that we could somehow display instantly to law enforcement that we are the good guys. That's not the case. So just go with the situation that occurs and try to keep out of your feelings to avoid getting into an argument at gunpoint, which is never the place to argue with anybody really about anything. The, the elephant in the room usually is what should I say when questioned? Well, here's the thing. Law enforcement may ask you some initial questions. Uh, there's no harm in giving them facts that are apparent. like. Yes, that's my gun. That may be not an apparent fact, but you did call and say you shot someone in self-defense. So if that gun isn't yours, then where is your gun? You know, see, you see what I'm saying? The facts that are immediately apparent to the officer, he just may not know what the order they're in or exactly specifics, but you can kind of help him along the way. Those initial responding officers may be your best friend um, because they're going to take their initial uh, observations and give them to whoever is investigating the situation. In the very unfortunate litigious society that we live in, sometimes we have to get allies where we can get them. Now, obviously, I'm pro-law enforcement, as long as those law enforcement officers are actually taking their oath seriously. Uh, but uh, 
in a self-defense situation, I want those cops to be on my side, or at the very least, I want them to be indifferent to the situation. And I want them to give the honest account of the situation onto whoever's investigating it, so that's going to benefit me in any way it possibly can. Uh, you need a lawyer. Absolutely, 100% need a lawyer. Um, even if you don't use that lawyer, it's a good idea to have a lawyer. You, there's a lot of prepaid services that I've heard are very, very good. Never used one personally, I mean, for a shooting. Uh, so I can't say you know how well it goes, but again, we talk about how few shootings there really are by citizens, actual uses of lethal force, so there may not be a whole bunch of data out there. Um, but even in a situation where you draw your firearm and don't actually have to use it, you may still face some kind of civil litigation uh, based on how the situation plays out. So lawyer, lawyer, lawyer is obviously a hugely important thing, and they will obviously be able to walk you through the rest of this, which I won't even attempt to do. Because uh, once once uh, an arrestable situation occurs, or a potential arrestable situation occurs, and not necessarily you, but the guy that you you use your weapon against, a crime has been committed. Everything after that is not my lane because I am not a lawyer. Uh, cops aren't lawyers. They know the law. They should know the law sometimes better than they do. And sometimes a cop knows just as much as a lawyer does, but you can't count on that. So you do need a lawyer. One of the things I think that's, that's overlooked a lot when it comes to uh, what you should do after you use force is, is your family prepared? Uh, those of us, you know, married kids, uh, is your wife prepared to call 911 on your behalf if you have to hold a guy at gunpoint? It has you have you talked to her? Are you gonna, you know, show her this video and, and say, look, like you got to give a description of my clothing, where we are, the situation, facts only. Um, so if I'm preoccupied, then then you can act as my voice or or your own voice and just tell the story. Uh, so law enforcement is, is best equipped through the dispatcher when they respond because there's just no avoiding the fact cops are going to come. So you have to accept that eventuality. I know we all love punching holes in paper and shooting real fast and looking cool, but the ultimate goal for me as a self-defense instructor is to get students prepared for in the unlikely event that they have to use force. There's stuff that comes after shooting that threat. And we need to be as, as prepared for that as we are for you know our one second you know draw from concealment and our, our .15 splits. Like, all of this is a completely total package, and you can't draw a line of, I want to do all this cool stuff, but I'm going to draw the line once it gets too serious. I don't really want to get involved in all that. You know, I bought all this multicam. I don't want to worry about getting a lawyer. I don't want to have to prepay for legal defense. And Man, that's, that's just not my thing. You can't actually say that. Well, I mean, you can. It's foolish, though. You need to be prepared for the event in the unlikely but possible event that you actually have to use force. How much for that have you trained and practiced? Um, right now, just think about it. How many steps do you have to go through on your touchscreen phone, your Samsung or your, your iPhone or whatever, to actually call 911? How many steps do you have to take? Do you know immediately, like, intuitively, like, oh yeah, it's like three steps, or it's like two steps, or I got an emergency call button or what have you. Some people may have to like literally look at their phone and be like, you know what, I've never actually checked. Let me check that out. That's important information to know. Following on with that, uh, and this is this video, I've already kind of talked about this in a previous video about you know using verbal commands and things. You have a camera phone too. There's nothing that's gonna keep you from recording video or at the very least hit record, throwing the phone in a pocket or something like that. So at least you're getting audio. Uh, or a loved one or a family member or, or you know a friend that you're with. Get documented information as soon as you can of how things go down. And as much as we practice in shooting for the spontaneous self-defense situations where it's literally just boom, Sometimes, and, and I would say most likely, the situations develop over a period of time. That time may be 10, 15 seconds, or maybe five, six minutes, or longer. And the longer a situation is bleeding up to, despite your best efforts to de-escalate it, a lethal force encounter, the more likely that someone is recording that. And that person may already have some kind of cognitive bias against you based on the totality of the situation. So. If you have someone, you know, like, hey, if, if, if this situation happens and you're nowhere need, you don't need to actually physically help me deal with this, please record what's going on so we have both sides of the story from an unbiased source of information, or at least someone who's biased on your side, because let's be honest, it's very hard to be objective in a situation like that. A potential and very possible complication to the relay of information and uh, the order and how efficiently and how well you're able to do things after the use of lethal force is uh, some psychophysiological um, occurrences, symptoms, aspects, things that may happen, things that are likely to happen. Um, I talk about these things a lot because they do occur and they affect every single person differently. Now there are some consistencies, but for the most part everyone's going to have a very unique experience when they use lethal force. One of the biggest things that's going to uh, affect 
um, your ability to impart information, whatever information you choose to, to impart on those uh, immediately responding or the 911 dispatcher, the law enforcement officers as they arrive on scene is what has become known as critical incident amnesia in which through the activation of your sympathetic nervous system and all the psychophysiological things that occur when that happens, you may actually temporarily or maybe unfortunately permanently forget very specific details about the situation as it takes place. Those of you who have taken a classroom, you know I talk about this um, uh, at least once a class because it's a very, very real possibility. Uh, every single person I know who's used lethal force when we talk about the specifics, um, there's small details that they'll admit like, yeah, I don't really remember about this or I wasn't sure about that. So it's very important that you know that this can happen. The reason I bring it up is the further you get from the incident, the more likely you are to remember as much as possible. Um, the way I was instructed, um, was 48 hours or two sleep cycles was a, was a good good uh, distance of time from the incident to to try to uh, have maximum recollection occur. So when I do finally give my statement through my lawyer, um, I have as many of the facts as I'm able to remember uh, because the brain is just just so misunderstood when compared to or so or it's not as understood I should say as many other aspects of our physiology. Um, there's no accounting for, no predicting how much or how little you're going to know and remember from the situation as it, as it happens. So again, my advice to you in that situation, and I'm not giving legal advice, is make sure that statement's given through a lawyer and make sure a, a, a very good chunk of time, as much as possible, uh, passes before you give that statement. Especially today in our very media-driven world, you, you look at law enforcement shootings, they're trying to get the officer to tell his side of the story like that night. And that's just not good. It's not acceptable to allow the media to drive an investigation. And this is something I'm pretty passionate about and I'm, I'm not really gonna talk about it in this video, but I think you can already see it kind of gets my, my dander up, so to speak. Uh, things need to take time and things need to take as much time as they need to take to get to the truth. If you use lethal force, like there's no taking that back. So let's just, let's just take our time and get the, is the whole picture of the truth as well as we can. And your side of that is going to be allowing enough time to pass some sleep cycles, some rest, some good meals, trying to decompress uh, to a point where you remember as much as you can uh, about the event as it occurred. Some, some may feel that the information I've uh, presented is kind of incomplete, but the, the steps are really that simple. Um, you know, make sure the area is immediately safe, reacquaint yourself with your surroundings, identify potential witnesses, uh, get others to assist, co-opt them into a, uh, rendering aid if necessary, uh, make contact with 911. And then when 911 arrives, I'm kind of handing that off uh, because I'm not going to tell you how to talk to the cops uh, other than to be you know, respectful and obviously, like what I said, do exactly what they say when they say it just to prevent any possible confusion. Um, and obviously your wording on, on identifying weapons and things like that, be very careful about that so they don't take what you're saying as a threat instead of just information like, hey, the gun's over there. Um, the reason I won't teach you or try to try to in this video uh, co coach you through talking to law enforcement is I don't know the situation you're going to find yourself in. So it'd be very hard for me to give you a script that may not fit what actually happened. So I, it would be, to me, I think it would be irresponsible of me to attempt to give you even a basic framework of how it's going to work. You can give them facts that are immediately apparent. I don't see any problem with that. You may, which means you may not do it. I'm not saying you have to do it. I'm saying that's my advice to you. Um, and obviously a lawyer is a thing that you have to have. But beyond that framework, um, that's as far as I'm going to go because I'm not a lawyer. And every step after that may require legal counsel, unfortunately. Um, you may be one of the few lucky people who you're in a place where self-defense is, is prided upon your actual natural right. And as long as the investigation shows that the shooting was, was in fact unfortunately necessary, then you're good to go. But I think most of us live in a place where that might probably be more the exception than the rule. I covered a lot of information uh, and I put, and again, like I said, I put those statistics in there at the beginning um, to kind of lay the foundation for what I'm talking about. The number of people who have that actual firsthand or even secondhand lethal, lethal use of force uh, information is pretty small because luckily we don't use our firearms in self-defense uh, nearly as often as maybe the media wants people to believe that we do or maybe you thought actually happened. Um, again, those statistics are, are almost surely wrong, but they're as close as we're going to get to the truth. 
uh, unless someone comes up with a better way to collect this information and hopefully we can get the media to stop being so biased against the Second Amendment and those who want to defend their lives because apparently that's just a bad thing to do. But anyway, um, take this information and, and obviously, you know, uh, do with it what you will, but I highly encourage you to independently research everything I've said, just like any other video, trust but verify. Um, don't take my word for it, so to speak. Um, because the best way to learn anything is to physically seek out the, the knowledge yourself as opposed to relying on someone else to tell you the way things are. At least that's how I like to learn. Um, I love going to a class and learning things, but I always independently verify those big factual nuggets of information, especially if they go with what I thought I knew. Um, because that, that, sh that paradigm shift, if you will, that shift in the mind, um, I like to make sure it's concreted in my own independent research so I don't have any doubt left if in fact what I did believe was not actually the case. I'm Eric Allen with Sage Dynamics. Research accordingly.